Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Well, welcome to Become Famous Podcast. I'm really excited to have a friend of mine from my DC days, and he's had this amazing journey that we're going to talk to. He has more than 20 years of experience of mobilizing fans, audiences, voters, and consumers within entertainment, government, advocacy, and brands. And I have to say, I was really impressed with how he was rallying on various the movies that I have. I was one of the people that was his supporters in that. And he was a former speechwriter and press secretary, a movie marketer and executive producer and live entertainment executive who's currently helping businesses, artists and government with their launches. And he and his wife have three kids. They live in Nashville, but they have been everywhere. And I'm so excited for us to talk about that. So welcome. How are you? Lauren, good to see you. Long, <laughs> long lost friend. We reunite. We reunite. We have like these certain intersections, a little bit oh. in DC, a little bit in New York. And, and then when I saw you, I was like, Oh, you're out there talking. I was like, I really want to have you on because you really understand the whole thing of the intersection of Hollywood and then DC. And as I used to always say, Hollywood for the uglies is where I was working, <laughs> but you've been in all of it. So welcome. Thank you. It is, I've been following your podcast and your writings and, I love what you're doing. I love the guests you have. So it's an honor to be here. And uh, yes, we both have had a similar crazy um, start in DC. And and then from there, all these different t- twists and turns. So thank you. How did you, I would love for you to talk because you were a speech writer and uh, then you go from there into the movie industry. Could you just give a little bit about your journey? Because I think your journey is very fascinating because I think you really show how the talents of politics can mm. really translate. And I think people like scoff at politics, but I really think it's a great training ground. I agree. Um, entertainment is political and politics is entertaining, uh, I like to say. Yeah, I started off, my my dream was to be a speechwriter back in college. And I, I love the fact that words could influence hearts and minds and not just words that you read, but as a speechwriter, you're writing for the ear. You're writing for people to feel something. So a typical speechwriter has terrible grammar. I mean, you look at a speech and it's staccato and it's incomplete sentences and all the things that you would never want to publish uh, in a book. It's just a style and a rhythm you're looking for. And I loved um, in history, all these great orders and loved how there was poetry and there was, of course, a a, an agenda or to, an ideal of what you're trying to convey. And so I went to DC thinking, I want to be a speechwriter. I've seen West Wing. I, I know what the glamour looks like. And then I became a press secretary, which, you know, as you know, you do a bit of that. You're doing press releases and op-eds and speeches. And then I was um, a part of the Republican National Convention in 2000 and was writing speeches for leaders. Uh, and it was just a, a fantastic experience because that was, as you know, was George W. Bush's coming out and he was, Mike Gerson was writing his speech. And I remember meeting with Mike the, the day of, um, of candidate George W. Bush's speech. And it, he was so nervous. This is Mike Gerson, so nervous that he couldn't watch it to walk the streets of Philadelphia, uh, to get his energy up. But from there, I actually became a speech writer. And um, all the dreams and uh, ideals of I'm going to sit with the principal and work with them on their on shaping their policies and their messaging. You realize speechwriters in D.C. are oftentimes put in the basement and you're handed <laughs> policy and legal information. You write something beautiful and it goes up to the, the policy people and the attorneys and it comes back and just says, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Have a great night. And everything else is gone and X'd out. So um that was my that was my fulfillment of my dream and realizing I did learn a great gift in communications and writing, but um, it wasn't all it cracked up to be as a speechwriter. <laughs> it's not. No, it's not. And, it's not. Yeah. So what? So what did you do from there? So you kind of realize that, and then what does that bring you to? Yes. So people have asked me. So how do you go from politics and government into the movie business? And it was the most strange circumstance. There's no, um, there's no direct line there. It was, it was something that I had really come to believe that 
that upstream from politics was the, was the artist, was the creative. Was So I had come to this realization through a bunch of different um, relationships and experiences that that the artist and the storyteller and the songwriter were upstream from political life. That if you really wanted to shape hearts and minds, if you wanted to shape the world, it's always been the artist and the creative person leading the way. And that government leaders, politics is all sort of flows out of that and is more reactive. It's not creative. It's more reactive to the state of the world. And that is a very important thing. But I was increasingly looking at the, the, seeing these artists flourish, these films do so well and drawing people together and having these moments where you had different people of different beliefs and backgrounds all together around a piece of artistic work. So a movie or a song or a concert, a TV show. Well, in politics, of course, you just saw division. And this is 15, 20 years ago, divisions and, and just almost a um, disregard of our shared human experience. And I saw firsthand the power of the arts to do something that nothing like it happens in politics um and crazy enough a um through a bunch of little circumstances and relationships a friend of mine who was running a movie studio in la which, which was doing amazing work it was called walden media still around but walden had just done the lion the witch in the wardrobe and he came to me and said we have this movie it's nearly done but we don't know what to do with it we know it has <laughs> potential to do well. This is Benedict Cumberbatch is one of his first films. This is Michael Apted, a well-known director. This is um, an incredible cast. It's called Amazing Grace. It's about this guy named Wilberforce who lived in the 17, 18, early 1800s and wore a wig and passed bills. Well, I was like, well, I know that. I, I don't know the wig part, but I know the passing bills and I know Wilberforce. And I know that Wilberforce, as you know, crosses party lines, crosses all over him. He he is called, I've used this, he's more liberal than he liberal and more conservative than he conservative. Wilberforce was an abolitionist and he and his friends not only changed some of the cultural direction of the country back in Britain, but also helped end the slave trade, the global slave trade. That'd be like you and me saying, we're going to take on the defense department today. I mean, it was a massive, ingrained, entrenched industry where people had their wealth and their, li and their livelihood. It was massive, incredible. And he and his friends, through the arts, through politics, through government, through business, through education, transformed a country. And that movie was what got me into it. I became the project manager for the movie, which really meant um, from the finished, completed film, how do we get this out to audiences and how do we connect people to all the different parts of Wilberforce's story so that when it releases in theaters, people are leaning forward and ready to respond not only to the quality of the movie, which is a commercial, commercially important to have success, but also how do you stir people to do things in their own communities in our nation that are addressing the ills that we have. And it happened. It was insane over a year. What we saw that you could not put on a balance sheet. You could not say on a PL, this movie, um, these things that happened impacted the bottom line, but it is impacted maybe a triple bottom line financially, spiritually, and culturally, things were transformed through that movie. And I still go to these days, I still go to meetings and gatherings and I'll raise, ask people to raise their hand. Have you seen the movie? And they will raise their, about half will raise their hand and say how important it was for them who felt, I want to make a difference in government, in politics. How do I do that in a way that's winsome, that's creative, that's transformative, well, he's the he was the model. He is, is the model for that. And I I was on the receiving end because I was like, I love the way you almost created a political campaign around around the Amazing Grace because I was the recipient of that. And I remember I was in New York at the time, and it was just you know us going to the movie. The opening weekend is so important, and I'd love for you to talk about that because you really took you kind of in a sense revolutionized kind of the way. Um, what's the African American guy that? that does that woman. Uh, oh, Tyler Perry. Yes. He does. The, the African-American community does the same. Cause I was living in, in, in Harlem at the time. And I got into like an African-American Bible study. And I was the only white person there. And they were talking about, they're getting their SMS. We need to go to his movie because we want to mm -hmm. vote. We mm -hmm. are voting on making this movie very important. And so you kind of did a similar thing 
with that with that uh, film. And I really think you revolutionized. That's my point from looking from the outside. You really revolutionized that to become more of a of a practice. Very kind. I, there's a bunch of us that were working on this. So I want to make sure the credit is shared. What I didn't know any different. So I knew that the way you get something done in DC is you build a very broad coalition. You have very clear messaging. You compress, intensify an audience into a moment. And out of that moment, things can happen. So traditional marketing across entertainment and most things is let's just throw everything we can out there and hope that we find this audience and they convert to some action. And what we were looking at in the political world is, okay, we know our audience. That's the first thing of all marketing is who is your true audience? It's not, we, we would get people pitching us movies and say, well, my audience is everyone. <laughs> and there's no way that's everyone. It won't happen. And you don't have enough money or time to think of everyone. So it's who is my audience? What do I need to do to th make them feel like they're a participant with this movie or this concert or this um, show? And that's what politics says. It invites you to say, this all depends on you. You need to be a part of this. You can't be a passive observer in in a campaign for a candidate. You need to be participating with this donation or walking precincts or putting yard signs, something. And the same way in a movie campaign, we were asking people to be a part of this. We weren't saying, we have a movie, you're the audience, show up on, on opening weekend. No, you're a part of this now, all the way through and after. And the whole point of the campaign that we designed the model, and I've used it in every single thing I've done since, it all comes back to political and campaign life, is um, opening weekend is, as you said, it is voting day. You need to get a million people to do one thing at a single moment, and that's go to the movie theater. It's exactly the same thing in a political campaign. A million people doing one thing, going to the ballot box. And if if you do that, that triggers everything else. Commercial su success, uh, momentum for future projects, for future inventions. Um, you create a moment, and that's what we're trying to do is create moments that lead to things that are both commercial and um, culturally significant. Yeah, that was a fantastic success. That was a really, yeah. that was a really amazing. And you started doing that for several movies, right? Yes. So that after that was hired by Walden to be an executive. We did that for several projects. And then I realized this is, this is 2008. And I saw, I was sitting in an office in LA and wonderful people, great studio, but realizing something is happening across the country and the world with technology and with distribution and with content size. You had films like Juno and Open Water and um, a number of smaller films made with less money having massive success mixed with technology and the fact that we were democratizing filmmaking. And that just started this whole journey for me of 12 years, 13 years of applying what we learned, what I learned at Walden, to the films that we felt were probably um, in the middle space. They were, there was an audience, there is an audience that wants high quality, that wants great stories, that's not crass or not necessarily mass entertainment or superhero. There's this, it's an artful, soulful experience. And there's a large audience that was underserved. And the movies we did for over 100 movies and shows were all in that middle space, which is a co combination of people who are cause motivated, they're faith motivated, they're spiritual, they, they long for meaning, they want to come into the theater and have large margins for something to happen where they can dialogue about it after. And that's, that's the split entertainment these days is you have some who want just to be immersed and to escape and to be overwhelmed and entertained. And there's those that want something magical to happen, which is truly the essence of cinema is dark rooms or at home, you're, you're transfixed into a moment with characters and storylines that are resonating with you and you can't explain why you're haunted by things you can't explain and those movies that are haunting people were the ones that we were drawn to and i'm still um 
always looking for books, music, movies that are haunting people in the best sense of the word. So you're still doing movie making? Not, I mean, not as much. We did one a year, I did one a year ago. Um, it's just a different world now. Um, people are drawn to series and I get it. I love a great series on streaming. I think it's harder than ever to get people to the movie theater because you're asking people to do the thing that's most uncomfortable. There's two things there. One is, well, actually three things. Come to a show at a certain time you're forced to sit there without your phone for two hours, which is the only place in all of the entire world in all of our days that we're asked to put a phone down for two hours. So don't engage your, your phone <laughs> and then sit with strangers. And I had a conversation with a producer who was, who was saying she was watching a movie and someone walked in about 15 minutes th through the movie and sat about two rows behind. And the entire movie, she was unnerved because someone just sat there and she felt uncomfortable. And so what you're seeing in movie trends and all content and concerts, all this, is that people want to be with like-minded friends. They want to be with people who are like them. So everything in content is moving toward, okay, it's me and my people together. It's, you know, we're all similar. We're all, we all love this artist or like love Star Wars or love Marvel or love Pixar. We're all the same. And that is wonderful. For, for in many regards, like that locking arms around an experience, shared experiences are great, but it's also a bit of what art is not meant to be. Because the movies that I love to work on and have worked on, I want people to look around and go, how did that person get there? That person doesn't look like me. Because that's what we, back in the old days, um, you'd be in an elevator and you'd say, hey, do you see um, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Oh yeah, I mean now with clutter, a cluttered marketplace with so much content and so much offerings and entertainment, we don't have those shared experiences. So that's my concern is where we are now is that we're fragmented, distracted, totally siloed audiences and thousand niches. So where do you think we're going with that? Like where do you think where do you think entertainment's going? Like is it going to be like I just right now I don't even watch television anymore. I don't watch movies very much. It has to be really a higher threshold for me to spend that time. I think you're absolutely correct. Um, and so I'm more of a TikTok junkie. I love those little short. And I was like, I'm becoming ADD. I'm like I I'm seeing myself the disease of distraction. And I was like, and I think it's worse for us that aren't used to that. Like we're almost more distracted than the younger generation because we're not used to it. And so you mm. suddenly, like if I suddenly have someone I got to get to on Facebook and I'm supposed to just go to the messenger, but then I suddenly see something in the feed and I'm like, oh my God, I just spent 15 minutes. How did that happen? <laughs> right? I know. I know. Well, I, I tend to tell folks, this is helping me helpful for those in marketing and communication is I feel like there's four things going on that we're, that we're all fighting against. We're in this club of marketers that are trying to figure this out is one is this is the most cluttered marketplace in history seth go and talks about that so you have massive clutter and noise two you have an audience that's more fragmented and fractured than ever before three you have the traditional means of reaching an audience are all breaking down they're not working uh, you couldn't spend enough you can't do enough on a campaign to reach your audience and then fourth we have the attention span of a goldfish and so you have eight <laughs> seconds um you used to, and then those things together are a real problem. Um, we used to be able to say that you have two hours after someone experiences something to have them respond to a call to action. Now you're actually not, you have to be in the moment getting there then to respond. You can't even let them wait, and leave the theater, leave the concert, leave whatever the experience, the cause. It has to be happening in the moment. It has to be integrated. So where we're headed. My fear is that we are entering the bumper sticker entertainment world, which means if it can fit on a bumper sticker and I know what it is, then I'm going to go see that because it's an act of, of um, protest or loyalty to a certain belief system. Um, you know, I am not a fan of Christian movies, faith movies. I think that there are uh, many issues there. But you look at the, they're all bumper stickers. God's not dead. Um, I can only imagine. I mean, 
and and I have friends that work in there. I'm not disparaging them, but I'm I'm amazed at how we're getting to the place where if you have a tricky title or a film that's a little bit different or nuanced, forget about trying to get an audience. They don't we don't have time to pay attention and learn about a movie and understand the nuances. It has to be so explicit what it is. And I think the opportunity though is on streaming at home where where recommends and word of mouth and referrals and um, the ability to take time and digest things over time is going to be helpful. And now we're seeing that with Ted Lasso or The Bear or Shogun now, you're seeing an audience that wants to have lengthy series that they can digest and explore at whatever timeline they want to. And that will be that will be the trend. And in terms of music, just quickly, um, legacy acts. And I was in the concert business for two years, promoter for, for big names and comedians. And the legacy shows are doing incredibly well. So nostalgia and remembering your, your growing up and bringing your kids or grandkids to those experiences. That's, those are selling so well. Discovery, new artists, incredibly hard to break through. Almost a, almost a long shot for anybody to find um, a, a chance to break out of thousands of songs a day, thousands of artists publishing. How, in Nashville alone, in a certain month, there'll be 300 shows here. I mean, how do you know, unless you're a big, big name with a big machine behind it, or you're a popular artist from the past, how do you break through? So really, like when I talk about the book, there's a danger of fame inflation. We are mm. having an inflation of creators. And I was actually thinking when I wrote the book, and I, I admit that I'm wrong right now, is I was thinking there can never be an inflation. You just find a little niche within the niche within the niche that you can be known in. But I do believe possibly now that we are in a fame inflation. There's a gluttony of all this great content out there that how do you actually stand out? And I always said that mm. it's possibly if you're more authentic. But even then, if you have a hundred authentic people, how do you stand out? Yeah. Well, that's, and that's where I think all of us who do work in the creative world need to find some rest, which is, and this has been said by countless people is we have to love the process, not the outcome. The outcome for all this is, is not up to us. I mean, you could, I have had friends who had amazing movies released on a, a weekend where there's a hurricane. <laughs> and, you're, and, you have, and you're thinking of all the times, of all the work. But ultimately, if you're a musician and you are working your craft and that you can't control is the practice and the performance and the creativity of writing a new song, releasing it, having the support of the team, of course, having the, the work ethic to make sure that it gets as far as possible. But ultimately, it's not up to you. So there's some rest there to say, okay, well, I need to make a living, but I'm also just only going to focus on what I can control. And that's across everything. Even in marketing for a business or a brand, you have to know that there's so many things that could happen that you can't control. And so you have to rest in that and work with people who understand that as well, because people will lose it. The lack of control, people will lose their minds, as you know. I know. And it's interesting because having come from a world where I could, where you could control things, like I worked for a Utah senator and you had three hours when something, a bill passed, you had three hours to prepare and you had all this time. And then I remember talking to David Merman Scott, who's on here several times, like, you know, when you're in the instant world, you don't have it anymore. It's, it's yeah. very fascinating. Yes, it, it is. Um, the instant nature of all of us, um, I think that's why communications people, marketers um, are so important because half of our job is to anticipate what could go wrong, what could go right. I tell people all the time, I'm not being hired with for just necessarily new ideas. I'm being hired because I know what not to do. Because over 25 years, I've learned all the mistakes. So the, that is partly of my value is to say, okay, that idea will not work because I've done that before and this is why it won't work. <laughs> So, well, I have I'm, the battle scars. <laughs> oh, PTSD battle scars. <laughs> oh, I know. I've had some crazy ones, and I'm like, oh my <laughs> gosh, I can't believe this. Crazy people too, not just yes. Oh, I know. 
So um, when you're looking at all of this and where you are now and you look back on your life and fame and because you're, you're, you're known within certain circles, so you have to say that you've written a book, you have really been able to stand as a, as a leader in what you're doing. Um, do you have any advice for people? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think the saying of uh, in, the, in your 20s, you think you can do everything in your 30s. You think you can do any, you can't do anything. You feel like I'm, I'm just awful at everything. In your forties, you realize, um, you can do one thing in your fifties. You actually do it. That is not a perfect science, but in, in my twenties, I wanted to do it all. And I thought I was good at everything because if you're, if you're a competent person, uh, professional, your delusional thinking is, I can do anything and you really could do things, but you're not great at that. You're just good at it. Um, I, you know, I, I am good at this. I'm good at that. You begin to think that you can do everything great. And then I went through a stage of, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I can do this. I, I it's not working. There's failure. I'm drinking champagne one day and at, taking aspirin the next week because <laughs> I'm in pain and celebration back and forth. And, uh, you know, I got to make payroll. Um, you're an entrepreneur and you're going months without income. I mean, all that is just, you're thinking, what am I doing? I, I, go, I need to go find a corporate job and sit in a cubicle and retire. Um, <laughs> which, which, which is t- tempting for entrepreneurs. Um, and then, you know, in your forties, I, I felt like, okay, I kind of understand who I am. And then now I am 51. By the grace of God, I feel that there's so many things that, didn't seem to connect and now are all connected. And it really comes down to, um, I believe there are um, opportunities for people when they are awakened to something and they're given the tools and they're seeing a vision, the things that we can, can accomplish is just unbelievable. That's what I see every day is we can do that. We can solve this. We can make that happen. And I love being around creators who have an idea and they have a dream. And my whole world now is helping them get as far as possible. What's the fullest potential of that creative idea, whether it's an artist or a brand or a, um, a podcast or a startup. Um, and I think people need to have some perspective that again, work on your craft, follow your process, but also realize that the journey of this life, like, you're 25, you're so young, you're just starting off. Your life's going to twist and turn all the way through and your career's going to be so different in 10, 15 years. Um, and realize just, you know, try to find things you're great at that you love to do and double down on that. So what would you say is your one thing? Uh, I, I think it just comes back to, I get energized in a live moment in, in that when, when everything matters, so it could be an election, it could be a concert that, um, you have to sell 15,000 tickets. It could be an opening weekend for a movie. It could be, as we just did a, a large initiative for foster kids when everything matters, it's all on the line. There are those that shrink from that. That's too stressful, like a live experience, everything can go wrong. But that's where I'm drawn to is <clears throat> create a moment where people feel in the room. This is a start of something massive. There's something happening. And if when you feel that as a producer, as a marketer, and you feel like they're you're, you've captured the moment, it is the most addictive drug I've ever I've ever taken. <laughs> it is it is uh, it is life giving, and you can see what happens out of that moment. So if I can do the one thing is help people create moments that are, are significant and meaningful. I, I, you know, there are a lot of things you can create moments for, but I want to create a moment where people leave the room and they go, I I'm ready to do that, to change this, to make that happen. That's the one thing. Oh, that's great. So what is authenticity to you? Because I think moments need to have an authenticity to it. How do people tap into their authenticity? Mm. Because I think sometimes we get so many layers that we put on ourselves. I call it the coat of layers. We put all these layers of expectations and we think they are us, but they're not us. Hmm. 
Yeah. And you said this so well in the past and other, other, um, other podcasts is just this, there is a, a need for vulnerability and a transparency uh, generationally has changed a lot. So if, if I walked up into a room full of college students and gave them a lecture, they're, they're, they've tuned out. <laughs> Don't talk to me, talk with me. Right. And with that, the, what I do when I share my story is I try to really talk about the incredible failures, the like family rattling soul shaking failures that I've done. And in a way that is, is not like, well, I've overcome that. Now I'm not making failures more of, listen, this is, this is my story is as broken as anybody's. Um, and I think we're seeing that in leaders that the leaders were drawn to are the ones that start off with a, a personal story that is, um, connects well, that makes them feel like they're, they're, they're part of us. And this is why I see this in social, just to digress a little bit is there's authentic social. You have two trends in social in my mind. You have one where someone is so removed, you're, they're so distant. They're perfectly pictures. They're, their lifestyle, the, what they drive, what they wear, what, where they live is so removed from their audience that the audience feels like, oh, I wish I could have that. I, I so long to do that. And that I don't think is a future. What the other side of it is, are those that are pulling back the curtain, who are inviting you into their behind the scenes, their, uh, their own struggles, their, their day-to-day lives. Like that's where people, that's where the growth is happening is because I want to know I can I can imagine, I can see the whole glamour of your life, the perfection, the created life. I want to see what's real. And that's where social, I think, has power to, to really connect people is, hmm, so this is not a perfectly created life. You're not always happy. You're not always looking your best, being your best. So how did you, and then this was the last question, um, or second to last, how, um, how did you because in DC we're taught so much to be putting a facade or creating the facade. Speechwriters create facades and moments. And mm-hmm. How did you come into yourself internally to share that? Because that's quite a journey for you, for someone to to go to that moment of their own authenticity. Lots of therapy. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, that's I'm, great. I'm glad you're admitting that. That's wonderful. Well, I, I I've done. Um, I've always been self-aware. I've also understood my limitations and my own. Um, I've been taught and have been under people who talk about there's eight feelings that we have. There's only eight feelings. And some of those are shame, guilt, fear. And we tend or tend to taught these eight feelings are bad, but actually, you know, anger is a good thing. Uh, rage is not a good thing, but anger is what drives passion. You want to change something that's not right. Justice. Um, Shame and fear and loneliness. Loneliness is a, a feeling where you are are propelled to reach out to others, to find community, to find relationship. Um, so I think being self aware and realizing that, for me, in a spiritual sense, I came to a deep understanding of what was it, what's called common grace, and it is the belief that there are. Beautiful things, good things, true things created by things that, by others, other people that may not share my beliefs. That you can find beauty and truth and goodness everywhere and anywhere if you're looking for it. And that is because we all have an imprint of a creator that um, that loves his creation. So when I talk to a political opponent or someone who doesn't share my same lifestyle. I see their humanity. I see their the potential and who they are and their creativity. So a, a dancer on Broadway, I'm going to absolutely rise to my feet and give a stain ovation. And they may be completely different than me, but I see the beauty in them. And the moment you start seeing that, you're, you're, you don't get fearful or you don't run from others. You, you step into it. And I, I think that's that combined with uh, living in the tension um, of these of life that we're kind of in the middle we're we're all trying to navigate this tension and no one's figured it out and I think when you start 
taking that in and saying, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to have all the answers. I'm not going to be um, always the best version of myself. You know, that's humility, hopefully. That's some courage to just live out your life the way you are meant to be, who you're made to be. Uh, so yeah, it's a bunch of things that I think have become very clear over the last um, certainly few years that have helped me just settle into myself. Oh, I love that. Settle into yourself. So looking to the future, this is the last question. I always say, what is your selfish legacy and your selfless legacy? So what do you want to become mm. known for? Like self, like what is it you, and you don't have to have both, like, but if you're going to think about what is it that you want to be known for, like personally, your achievements and maybe what you want to give to the world. Because a lot of times if I just ask and then everyone says save the world, yeah, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's like the political correct one. That's why I give you permission for both, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. I, um, I went through an exercise where I, I did write my eulogy and I, oh, I love doing that. I did that with Donald Miller. That was fantastic. Yes. Was yeah. Donald Miller does it. And it's, yeah. and then you just, you, you write your eulogy and then you try to live it out. And my eulogy is, is really focused on my kids, my three kids, um, family, um, and the, and friends, but, and what they will remember me and what I gave to them. Um, in terms of professional world, I just want to be known as a contributor to things that are worthwhile. And that if it's big or small, that I had my hand on things that um, that leave things better. Like I, I really think that if we could all have approach of whatever industry you're in is to leave audiences better, to leave uh, our planet better, to leave our industries better, to leave our conversations better, where people leave the room and in the arts they leave the theater leave the gallery they leave the book they leave the song better than they were when they first approached it first came in what else can you ask for exactly what else can you ask for well thank you so much for your time uh we will leave uh in the show notes where we can find you um and i would just want to say thank you for the most wonderful conversation Warren, thank you so great to be with you love what you're doing thank you so much Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time. Mm-hmm.